who are participating yeah. remotely by the Zoom or in the live Grad Talk uh, YouTube channel. Welcome to Yildiz Technical University, uh, located in a beautiful city of Istanbul. If you are new, uh, I am, my name is Murat, Vice Director of Gradu Graduate School of Science and Engineering. Uh, I'm also a high energy physicist. On this Grad Talk seminar channel, we talk about science, engineering, economics, architecture, design, future technologies and trending topics, and some tools and strategies that will help uh, us to have meaningful and fulfilling careers in our field of interest, especially for the graduate students. Uh, Grad Talks have been uh, two years and we have been setting a lot of positive <clears throat> feedbacks about our seminar. Now we are starting our third round and I'm very delighted to acknowledge you that we start with a very special guest uh, with a Nobel Prize winner in economics and science, a little spoiler. Uh, and I would like to pass the microphone to uh, our head of economy department, Professor Murat Anil Merja. He will make the introductory remarks for the <laughs> Professor Roger Meyerson. Hocam siz deyiz. Mikrofonunuz hocam, mic is off. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me right now? Yes, evet hocam. Uh, okay. Uh... First of all, I want to thank you all for participating in our event. Uh, it is my high honor and uh, distinct privilege to introduce you to uh, Roger Myers. <laughs> Professor Myerson has a PhD from Harvard mm -hmm. University and he is the David Pearson Distinguished Service Professor of Global Conflict Studies in the Higher School of Public Policy and the Griffin Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. Myerson has made groundbreaking uh, contribution to economics. Uh, in game theory, he introduced improvements of Nash's equilibrium concept. He has also applied game theoretic tools to political science. Myerson is the author of two books and has published numerous articles in top academic journals. He has received uh, several honorary degrees and he was awarded the 2007 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Uh, I want to remind you in our seminars, uh, first we have the presentation then we have to, we have time for Q and A. Uh, now, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Professor Myers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's my privilege to be to be your guest today. Uh, there's important things to talk about. I uh, um, talk about game theory in the First World War. I am I'm grateful to Professor Sima Yilmaz Gens for inviting me to come and speak at, at Yildiz Technical University today. And uh, 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 th there's a lot of history and there's this war happening now. I should say, uh, I, I, I think I, I should should talk for, for, for some period, but uh, if I, I'll rely on uh, uh, Professor Yilmaz Gens to, to interrupt if, if, uh, if there's pressing questions, but uh, I hope we'll have time for, for for discussion afterwards, um, there is. I I I I do have to say um, uh, before I start anything else that, that that it's it's a matter of public record that I've recently signed two open letter petitions with regional relevance to to in Istanbul, including one about the protection of academic freedom, and and I wanted to just display a a link to the marketdesigner.blogspot.com where where uh, someone else this is. Al Roth's website, but he he's listed these uh, these letters. And if anybody wants, we're not discussing that today. But if anybody wants to uh, discuss with me what 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 those letters say and correct me or endorse or whatever, uh, I, my email is public, and I would welcome that such discussion. Uh, there's a map of of the world in, in around World War One, but let me get to work. Um, I. Uh, uh, 
this this paper. I, let's see. The, the, my my. I hope my uh, my cover slide is is uh, visible. And I uh, my paper is um, uh, is is available on the web. It will at some point in I hope in the near future be published in the Journal of Economic Literature. It was published as a, a review of of a couple of books uh, about the First World War that were written for the I think the centennial perhaps uh, that came out around the centennial of the end of the First World War. But my goal really is, is well, th there's two different things to talk about. One is uh, the, the horrors of war, and in particular, the First World War is a is a is a, is a difficult is 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 a is an important example still to consider. Uh, the horrors of war are wasteful, and yet they happen. Uh, um, and so we want to understand, for example, the first the, the many dilemmas of the First World War. But uh, we also I want to talk about game theory. Game theory is a methodology that's useful for understanding that. World War I still demands deeper understanding, as I say, it's, but it's also a vital test case for probing game theory's explanatory power and the limitations of, our, of game theory's basic assumptions. Um, uh, the book by Roger Ransom that, that my, my paper reviews, I'll probably say less about, a little bit about, but... Uh, uh, his talk, his his book was more about um, overconfidence and uh, and 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 biases in decision making and how they contributed to the First World War. Uh, Scott Wolford's book, The Politics of the First World War, uh, that my paper is a review of, is a truly a remarkable book. As I say, it uh, it's actually a course on game theory, in which. You know, I, I've taught game theory, and I think some of my, my hosts and friends at, at, at Yildiz have, have, have teach game theory for you. Um, uh, there's certain kinds of examples you want to take people, certain ideas you want to take people through. Scott Wolford's book is a course on game theory that uh, introduces all the ideas of game theory using examples and dilemmas from the First World War. Uh, what's truly remarkable is that, of course, when you teach a technical subject like game theory, the examples you use to illustrate various points have to come in perhaps some order. You don't do the hardest examples first. You start with easier ones. He has done that, of course. He's done, But he's also, the main example in every chapter comes in historical order. So those are two very different orders. If you're taking examples from the period of 1914 to 1918, um, uh, the historical order of your examples is not necessarily the, the right pedagogical order for the points that you're hoping to illustrate. Uh, but he's got enough examples and enough redundancy that he's able to, to do both orders, which is quite remarkable. It says that there's a it's a, some talent to the author is 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 to admire is is to be expressed in admiration, but also that that game theory has many uh the, the World War One has many enigmas and game theory has something to say about many of them. Um uh let me uh, say um, one of the main points that I, I'd like to, to, to emphasize is, is that uh, at the very beginning, with Wolford says, of his book, Wolford um, makes a remarkable comment. He says that rational choice analysis can humanize our image of historical actors. Let me say what we do when we um, start, make a game theory model of something. World War I is a terrible, is an example of civilization. The, the Turkey and the Ottoman Empire, the British, the Americans, the Germans, the Russians, all involved in massively murdering and destroying, murdering each other and destroying each other's, you know, assets. For what? Um, uh, surely there was a better way. So th there's a lot to be understood. Uh, it would be easy to explain the horrors of World War One by saying that some fraction of the um, of the nations of the world were led by monsters, by horrible people. Yes, uh, that would be an easy explanation. And that would explain monstrous people, monstrous evil demons that wanted to uh, destroy, um, uh, that simply relished and uh, simply enjoyed uh, murder and destruction for, for, for their horrible reasons. Uh, that doesn't make a good game theory model because we normally assume that our game theory actors are motivated by, if you want to make a good game theory model, I'm speaking to, to my colleagues and to students who are want to, want to use game theory in their work. In a game theory model, you need to explain why uh, the terrible things of events like World War I happened. Those are interesting questions. 
Um, but you want to explain them by by attributing normal, believable um, human motivations to the to the actors who, who were playing the game, to the agents who were playing the game. And for that, um, game theory models tend to humanize the actors. We don't want it. it. It's not a very interesting model to say destruction happened because some powerful person had a perverse taste for destruction. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I think that there's no question in World War II, the, the, uh, uh, one of the, 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 the country that started the, the war was, 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 was ruled by a, an individual who was uh, personally, had personal mental illness that, that made him uh, drawn to, uh, uh, to, to death and destruction. Uh, I would say a deeper rational choice question about World War I, about, excuse me, about World War II, and uh, the rise of a and Adolf Hitler's role as a uh, disturbed and, and dangerous uh, leader of a great nation um, uh, was why normal Germans uh, with who who are motivated by normal um, uh, human motivations might have supported Hitler for uh, for for power in his rise to power in the years before World War II and why they would have supported him during the war is another good question, uh, but. Um, uh, that's easier to understand because once someone gets power, it's easier for them to suppress dissent. Anyway, but what, but when we do game theory models, we look at the game from all sides. We don't. We, we uh, I study World War One, and I'm an American, and America joined World War One at some point on one side. Uh, do I identify with that? My good game theory model should look at it from all sides and should try to ascribe. If it's going to be an interesting game theory model, it's it's going to try to as ascribe uh, reasonable human mo motivations, and, uh, and and that's our methodology, and I think that's a good thing. Um, our goal uh, is, is, let me say, I, I, game theory models, I want to emphasize, uh, and, and here I'm following, going to follow Jim Fearon's uh, 1995 book, uh, 1995 article on rationalist explanations for war, a very important paper that I, that I, I would urge uh, people to look at if they're interested in re reading beyond what I, what I have to say in, from this paper. Um, Fearon uh, helps us to see that the, the model, game theoretic models of war really could be divided in two sides. And, and I've got to say something about what I, a, a methodological distinction between them. Models of war onset, the coming of war, game theory models explain why wars start. And, there are other, and we have other models that I'll talk about of how we uh, explain why wars last so long. The start of World War One in, in 1914, after a century of of of, of uh, almost a century of of of, 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 of mainly peace in Europe, um, uh, was is was a remarkable event. But then, the, the war once started, and, and when people were on both sides were optimistic it would be a short war, ended up lasting for four years. Um, that's a, that's a second question. We're going to talk. About, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about two different kinds of models for for analyzing that, and maybe even two different methodologies. Um, if you, there's one first thing to say is if we're going to have a model to explain war onset. The 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 model war war should be a Nash equilibrium in that, of of our game. The various actors, which may be nations or maybe subnational actors, the actors in our game should be each <clears throat> in their own way behaving rationally. Uh, in response to an understanding of the situation. Uh, and war is, first and foremost, if you're going to make a model of war, it should be a model where the equilibrium, of, where war is, is a Nash equilibrium, and some other feasible is some other feasible outcome is Pareto superior. Because one of the things that is, that is most important to understand about war is, is that it is costly and it's hard to understand why uh, people can be in a conflict that everyone would want to avoid and yet, no one will make the choices to get them out of it. That's that's the that's the problem to understand our, our understanding problem, and of course, the prisoner's dilemma uh, is an example. The well-known prisoner's dilemma game. I should have a slide that just shows it, but I think you all know it. Uh, is an example of a game with unique Nash equilibrium that's bad, and that's that's in fact in Walford's book. That's his first example of one of the the things that leads to World War One. There are other games like the Stag Hunt that have multiple equilibria, some Pareto inferior and some Pareto superior, and those also that also could be interpreted as a model of of, of war. Um, but Jim Fearon's paper on rationalist explanations for war onset is a remarkable paper because it unifies 
previous theories. He takes uh, theories from the from the from the political science literature and shows how a unified game theoretic framework can 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 explain all of them uh, or can can accommodate all of them. Um, but he also sets a higher bar. He doesn't want me to make a model like the stag hunt, which has um, multiple equilibria, some of which are bad and can be interpreted as war, and some of which are are good and, and represents peace. He says, and I would say this is a model of model. A discussion, he's talking about models of war onset of the start of war. He says, and I'll emphasize, it seems far fetched to think that small numbers of states would have trouble reaching the efficient solution in our, in our game model if coordination were really the only problem. So he's saying, if the nations are at peace and there are two equilibria, one where they go into a terrible war and, 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 and no one nation by deviated could do better, but another equilibrium, which was also sustainable where they're also going to be peaceful, he says, if they're, they're gonna stay in the peaceful equilibrium because they just have a meeting and say, let's all have these expectations. It'll make us all better off. Um, that's setting a higher bar for us to make a model that truly explains war. You have to find a model where no equilibria avoid uh, war and to satisfy Theron's uh, criterion here. Now, finding all equilibria can be hard, but if we can analyze incentive constraints uh, in, game, in economic theory and economics of information, we talk about moral hazard incentive constraints and informational incentive constraints, which even in a game that's where, where not, where, that has communication possibilities that are not fully specified, that, that we can say there are no equilibria that will violate any of these incentive constraints. So that gives us a way of verifying that the uh, that, that, that the equilibrium set uh, is bounded and away from certain areas. And if we can prove that it's bounded away from peace, that there are no peaceful solutions, that any peaceful solution would violate some incentive constraint, then we can be sure that for a, 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 a class of models, uh, the, the players will, when these parameters satisfy whatever the, the model assumes, uh, will be will be driven into war. So let me at least mention some of those important theories. Theories of preventative and preemptive war, Biron shows, can be derived from moral hazard incentive constraints. Preventative war is a is a concept in the in the political science literature where one nation is dominant now. Uh, but there's a rising nation that may become dominant in the future. And we're going to talk about that. 1914, Germany was the dominant nation, the strongest military power in Europe. But it was concerned about the rise of Russia's uh, military capabilities. And then there's a moral hazard incentive constraint. The dominant nation has the opportunity to launch a war now. And whatever it could get by, by launching a war and taking what it wants, uh, it, it, its payoff can't be less than that. That, that's a payoff not just now, but for the for the foreseeable future. The rising nation can't promise to accept less in the future than what it could get from launching a war once it becomes the more powerful nation. And those two moral hazard incentive constraints might rule out all the all the feasible set, and therefore we have to violate one of them. And that would mean that the dominant nation would launch the war now in order to try to prevent the, the to take what it could and try to prevent the rising nation from ever becoming dominant in the future. Preemptive war is different. Preemptive war happens as a one stage game. Preventative wars is gonna be modeled by moral hazard in a dynamic game. Preemptive war can really be done with a one stage game where there are two different wars. There's a war that where I attack first and there's a war where you attack first. And if there's a huge advantage to being the one who attacks first, then you see we've got a problem. Uh, uh, I, if I think you're going to attack, then I better attack. And if, if you think I'm going to attack, then you better attack before I before I wake up and do that. So um, uh, so neither side can accept less than what, what it could get from launching the war. And if there's an advantage to being the one who launches the war and, 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 and launches the first offensive, a first strike advantage, then uh, these incentive constraints may eliminate all feasible allocations. War can also be caused by informational incentive constraints. Uh, when one nation claims uh, that it uh, prefers war to a modest share, but but re but others think that that's probably a bluff. And I, so let me just not be abstract, but talk about all of those in the context of 1914. So, um, what? I, but I, what I want to say is, is I'm going to illustrate on this slide three. I'm going to illustrate um, all of these these kinds of theories. But I want to also say that there's a bit of a problem in going from onset war modeling to war duration modeling. Um, 
the theories about the causes of war have suggested, and this is probably, this, I, I think this may be a dominant uh, theme in the, in, the, in the game theory and war literature today. Many people have been written, writing papers that start with a very reasonable proposition, uh, a very reasonable proposition that um, to understand how long wars last, you have to understand what caused the war. So if you have a theory about what causes the war, then uh, the war will last until that cause goes away. Um, I'm going to suggest that, that for World War I, that's a serious problem. Whatever, there, All three of the theories of causality that I just described uh, can be applied and illustrated in the context of the, the start of war in 1914, but none of them seem to have anything to do with how long the war lasted. Look, Germany in... In, in July of 1914, it's the, the Kaiser of Germany warned his cousin, the, uh, the, the, the Tsar of Russia, uh, that Russian mobilization against Austria would compel a preemptive war. It would create a situation, he said, if the Russian, there was a crisis in Serbia, and I hope you all have some general awareness of what happened in 1914, uh, but I will get back to it and give a perspective on it. Um, Talking about a situation where a, a variety of wars and the and military operations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries had 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 pushed back the, the boundaries of of the Ottoman Empire in um, in, in in Europe in the Balkans and uh, and and the and, and the new countries that displaced Ot uh, the Ottoman regime uh, were extremely unstable and and hostile to each other uh, and there was a question of uh, the, the Serbia was 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 in, in, it was a, a primary regional client state of, of of Russia, an ally of Russia, and the Austria and the Ser and Serbian terrorists had just murdered the uh, in, in the sp in, in the early summer of of 1914. Serbian terrorists murdered the heir to the Austrian throne, um, and there was a crisis cost. Okay, in in July 1914, Germany warned the Russians. That if they mobilized while Austria was threatening their ally Serbia, the Russian mobilization would create, in the eyes of the German generals, the situation of a preemptive war, where either the Germans attacked first and won the war, or the Russians attacked first and won the war. And that the, the Germans were absolutely convinced of this, and that Germany would have no choice but to launch a war if the Russians mobilized their troops. Notice, mobilize, Russian mobilization means calling up Russian soldiers to their barracks and having them do exercises and march around, but they're going to march around on Russian territory. They're not shooting at anyone under this. Russians said, this is ridiculous. This is a bluff. We don't think that, that we'll be in a situation of preemptive war. So how can the German generals think that? The Ru Germans don't really believe that. So they mobilized, and then the Germans invaded Belgium and launched World War I. So this costly signal eliminated any doubts about, so this looks like a, uh, a informational incentive constraint right there. Preemptive war was involved. The Germans say, if Russia mobilizes, that having all these, um, having a million or more troops, Russian troops on our border, we'll, we'll have to mobilize our troops and then whoever attacks first because of the advantages of, of, of because the, we perceive, we see their advantages to attacking first, whoever attacks first will win the war and we can't allow our country to be destroyed. We'll have to launch a war. The Russians say that, you don't believe that, that's not true. Uh, so how do the Germans prove that they think that? Well, they launched the war. That's a costly signal, and they suffered. Everybody suffered, including the Germans, for four years. This was a costly signal that eliminated doubts about the truth of the Germany's warning, for sure. But the war was just getting started then. In fact, I'm going to argue after the war, asymmetric information increased. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, the question of the justification of, uh, of, of of was was Germany's invasion of 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 uh, um, now, let's say the fa simple fact is that after after the the, uh, the Germany invaded Belgium, um, when I say asymmetric information increased, I mean the people in England, for example, became absolutely convinced that this was proof that Germany was a was headed by by a monstrous militaristic cabal that wanted to dominate Europe and and was going to prepare to attack anybody until they they conquered Europe uh, and uh, established. A, a military rule in Europe. Uh, 
the Germans said, no, our war, we were very reasonable rulers, and, uh, and, and, and they were defending our country against, uh, a, a, we totally believe that our, they were defending our country against a mortal threat. So, and, and the English said, no, you don't believe that. You're, you're, just, you're, you're militarists. Uh, so there was totally symmetric information. It increased because of the costly signal. Furthermore, on the question of was, there, was this a situation where whoever attacked first had an advantage, trench warfare... Uh, quickly contradicted the assumptions of preemptive war. There was no advance. There were, this was a time uh, in the history in the history of, of military technology. There are times uh, when um, when offensive forces have an advantage, and there's times when defensive forces have an advantage. And it turns out, 1914, after the invention of the machine gun and the, the development of the machine gun and the invention of barbed wire, for example. Um, it was a time, but before the uh, the development of offensive air power, this was clearly turns out a time when uh, when defensive forces had had advantage. That's why there was a, a, a long trench warfare in the West, and and in fact, um, the assumption that the Germans had to attack on the West in order to prevent the Russians from conquering Germany is uh, completely contradicted, in fact, by the fact that in 1917, what was called the Ludendorff Plan. Uh, in the middle of the war, was the Germans shortened the 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 the, 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 the front line in the west and transferred troops to the, to the east, defeated Russia utterly, and caught you know and brought down the downfall of the Tsarist regime and the Russian Revolution and knocked Russia out of the war, and it would have been even easier to do that in 1914 when neutral Belgium would have shortened the the western line. So the idea that the Germans couldn't fight a, hold a defensive line in the west while while defeating the Russians in the east was just wrong. Um, look, look the, the preventative war theory was that Germany, Germany was the dominant power in 1914, as I've said. There were major, Russia had lost a war to Japan in 1905. So uh, in, in, in the early teens of, of, the, of the 20th century, R Russia was known to be undertaking a major military rearmament uh, and major military reforms in the Russian army were likely to were considered likely to make it much more much less inefficient and much more uh, potent. Russia was obviously a much larger country than Germany, and I believe its population was larger was significantly larger. So uh, once it, it once it got a more efficient army, uh, uh, there were predictions in 1914 that by 1917 Russia would be much more powerful than Germany, and so the only way to prevent the Russians from being able to conquer Germany and by that threat impose whatever they wanted on, on the Germans after 1917, Germany in 1914 would have to attack Russia, destroy it and uh, break it up uh, and, and prevent this, uh, this, this, this reversal of fortune. However, in 1917, the Ru Russian government, as I said, did collapse, the but the Russian revolution in 1917 did not end the war. The whole point of, if, if, the, if, if, if the condition was to achieve, if the war was launched to prevent the rise of Russia, uh, the, the German government had achieved their goal by knocking Russia out of the war and launching the Russian Revolution and separating Poland uh, and, and, and the Baltic states from uh, from from Russia. Uh, all that had been achieved by 1917, but the war it, the war continued. Look, we understand that even as old incentive problems are resolved, the mobilization of vast military forces can create new moral hazard problems. How you use the forces that you have that are armed and on on on, on alert. That are close to the, to your the other nation's forces and close uh, that can, those those new moral hazard problems constrain negotiations uh, uh, and as I the argument uh, so let me say the argument for ignoring this is important the argument for ignoring Pareto inefficient equilibria that that, that Jim Fearon in his 1995 paper expressed I think that may be appropriate for models of war onset where the nations begin in peace, but it's less convincing for models of war duration when we assume that war has already started. L what, one of the major conclusions I'm gonna watch, but let me introduce it now and say it again more later, is that peace is not just not shooting at each other. Peace means that, that the various nations of the world are in a relationship with an accepted framework for arbitrating disputes. Now. In a struggle for global leadership, it would be absurd to assume that both sides could agree on a focal arbitrator to help them designate a Pareto superior equilibrium. Let's say in the middle of World War I, when 
Turkey and Germany and Austria were, were, were killing people and doing everything they could to kill people from France and Russia and, and Britain and, and vice versa. And people from those countries were killing, you know, they, they, and they're just they're, they're, they're investing enormous amounts in the destruction of each other. It's obvious that everybody could be better off with a variety of settlements. Of course, the problem was, shall we settle to end this horrible war in ways that favor uh, the, the, the allied entente or shall we... Uh, 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 and the war in, in, in a way that fav favors the, the Central Alliance. And that's a deep question. Somebody's got to propose somewhere on the Pareto frontier favoring which side, will, or, or perhaps can we meet in the middle? Where's the middle? Woodrow Wilson, for example, in 1916, offered to broker, broker peace. He offered a quote, peace without victory. Good for Woodrow Wilson. But for, that's how we Americans think about when we read our history books. But the way it looked to the, to the people of, to the leaders of, 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 of Britain and, 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 and France and Russia and Germany and Austria and Turkey at the time was if Woodrow Wilson came in and arbitrated, that would be the beginning of U.S. leadership, global leadership. This was a struggle for who should dominate, who should lead the world in the future. And, the, and, we're, and both sides are going to agree to step aside and let the Americans do it. That's ridiculous. So my point is, there isn't an arbitrator. There isn't, you can't find an arbitrator to come and help you settle the, the conflict. So. So this says something fundamental. It says that perhaps when we think about um, models of war duration, when we think about when we think about models of war onset, we should assume that the nations are not just playing a game where they're all in, you know going to behave rationally and given what the, they understand about the other's behavior, and that they're not ill informed about the other's behavior, but also uh, they have. A framework when 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 serious conflicts arise, uh, serious disagreements arise, they have a way of sitting down together, perhaps with some new, some acknowledged neutral parties whom they respect uh, to, uh, to to come up with a deal. And there's an accepted framework. When there's war, that's the one thing that's missing. So now we should not assume that just because there's a better equilibrium that the, the players will find their way to it when we're talking about a game, in the analysis of a game where the war has already started. And in that sense, a model of, of how a war starts is going to, should be analyzed differently. Our, our game theoretic methodology for how we analyze it should be different from how we analyze a model which is where the war has already started and, and, the, and we're wondering how long will it take for them to end it. Um, the the standard model of the war of attrition is 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 a uh, um, is is in some ways the simplest and standard model of war duration. It's a, it, it is a model with multiple equilibria, including equilibria that are better than than war. I want to say a little bit about it because it gives us this methodological point I'd like to make here. Um, it's actually kind of surprising actually that that in Mulford's book, which I think is excellent, it it doesn't actually talk about the the the, the simple war of attrition model, and uh, and and I think I want to say I think I know why. Um, there are two nations. Let's I'll call them one and minus one. Just uh, 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 they're contending for shares. I'll get, look, so this this is my one slide with a technical model, and it's all, all the technical stuff is on on this one page. Uh, we have two nations. Uh, that are contending for for shares of a peace peacetime benefit that's wor worth what capital Y it says nation J demands some amount W J and it offers and and it's and nation J is also offered V J which is Y minus W J by the other nation uh, so W which is a bigger letter and V which is a smaller letter represent the the subscript is the nation that's getting that payoff. And the W is the payoff that they're demanding, and the V is the payoff that they're offering. Now, those payoffs that I'm talking about are flows. They're going to have peace. There's an, in, an infinite flow, an infinite time horizon flow of benefits in the future worth Y. And uh, Nation J is demanding a larger portion, and, 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 and it's off, but the other side is offering a smaller fraction. I'll assume that WJ is bigger than VJ, and they're both uh, bigger, strictly bigger than zero. When they're in conflict, there's a cost of conflict CJ that that's and negative CJ is what what Nation J pays when it when it fights. And expected future flows and benefits and costs are all discounted at some rate r greater than zero. This is a continuous time model, but I'm going to analyze it as if I'm taking the limit of 
short discrete time models as the as the period goes to the period goes to zero. That's how I'm really analyzing it. So let me just say, if I let Q, QJ, which might depend on time, uh, be the probability density of in the near future of the other nation accepting nation J's offer, surrendering, say, oh, I'm not going to fight anymore. Uh, I'm accepting your offer. They can, they can, either one can, can end the conflict by accepting the other's offer. Then nation J is willing to concede now as opposed to waiting a short period DT, if and only if. And ha there's this inequality here that I want to emphasize. Um, sorry, no. See if I can, uh, no, I can't. Um, I, can I can't highlight it. I've got an inequality that says CJ plus VJ. Well, if, if in the period DT, if they were to settle now, uh, then they would save, the benefit would be they'd save for the period DT, they would save the, the cost CJ times DT. And also they would get the, 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 the nation J would get this offer, D, uh, VJ rate over period DT. And DT is short, so we don't have to worry about discounting over this short period. So remember the decision, the alternative is concede right now or wait a short period, should nation J concede right now or should nation J wait a short period DT and then concede? And conceding the benefit of the left-hand side of this inequality here in the middle of the page, in the upper middle of the page, is uh, the benefits to, to conceding right now as opposed to waiting. But the benefits to waiting are, there's a QJ, D, QJ times DT probability that the other nation will accept our offer. And then we get the present discounted value. The benefit is we get the des present discounted value of our higher demand, WJ over our dividing by the interest rate to, uh, to, to, to get it to a present discounted value of an infinite time flow, rather than for now and for, in, forever in the future getting the VJ over R. So there's a conflict equilibrium where each nation's concession, each nation is totally indifferent. The basic war of attrition equilibrium is that each nation is, would be totally indifferent if, if it thought the other nation was conceding at exactly this rate QJ, that is to say, in any short time interval, it's extremely unlikely that the, that the other side will will quit, but it has a. It's possible QJ is exactly the probability of the of the of the other guy conceding, and so now I'm always indifferent between conceding now or waiting a little longer, or waiting a little longer, and uh, going on forever. Of course, is it also a possibility? Now, what are our payoffs? Well, it's obvious. This is a randomized equilibrium where both nations are completely indifferent about when they concede. Therefore. If, if nation J concedes right now, it gets VJ over R. It gets its what it, it gets the minimal amount that the other guy offered. Um, but so does but the other nation is expecting V minus J over R. It's its present discounted value. In other words, the expected cost of conflict completely cancels out the expected win gains. Somebody will win the war in the long run, but before they get to it, they're going to have a long costly conflict, and they're going to have to wait. And that cost is going to be so great that the expected cost of conflict will completely and expected value cancel out both nations' gains. Uh, th there are other equilibria of this game, and, and it's important. Let me just emphasize there are other equilibria. Concession expected soon from the other. There's an equilibrium. Pick either country and say, well, let's say that country J. If country J, if it's common knowledge that country J is confident that that that, con that the uh, that it's uh, opponent minus J is just about to, is, is going to concede very soon, it's going to surrender very soon, then of course J will never concede and therefore uh, the, the, the minus J should concede right away uh, because otherwise they'll never get, they'll never get J to stop. This would happen, for example, what would make the, this, this equilibrium focal? Well, one is if it's common knowledge that justice is on J's side, that that J is fighting a just war, and that that the, the opponent negative minus J is very uh, is 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 wrong, is in the wrong. Another possibility is that J is the big power and 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 uh, is the bully, and minus J has is, is knows the bully will never give up. Um, this conf that's the conflict equilibrium is Pareto inferior between to, to to tossing a fair coin and then saying if it comes up heads. J concedes, and if, if it comes up the coin comes up tails, uh, minus J concedes. You know, let's let's just either one would be better off uh, tossing a coin. What's wrong with this model? Why don't we talk more about the? What I want to say is this model has a problem, a big technical problem. It has some bizarre implications. If you look at the formula, um, the Q. I, I'm sorry, I forgot. I had lambda J was equal to the QJ that exactly made 
the uh, the the original inequality and a, a concept the critical I call it the critical success rate. It, what is what is that formula? The formula for the QJ that makes this this inequality in the upper part of the upper middle of the slide uh, satisfied with equality. That lambda J that makes it an equality. It has it's a formula. It's it's the the let's see CJ plus VJ upstairs. That's the cost uh, the cost of conflict plus uh, the for J plus the, the, the what the offer the, the other side times the, the interest rate yeah the it's a, it's this is a time rate so it should have an interest rate in there divided by the, the the how far apart the two sides are that's the critical success rate notice if you had a comparative a common knowledge comparative statics change suddenly we make the cost of war higher for nation J then lambda J goes up lambda J is the critical success rate for J that means that in this equilibrium that's explaining the duration of war, when the cost of conflict for nation J goes up, nation J's opponent has to become more likely to concede. Why? Because the only way to keep nation J willing to randomize is if the cost of conflict is, is just balanced by the potential benefit of, of, of continuing the conflict, namely hoping to extract a concession. So in order to keep me indifferent, if I, when my cost of conflict in, increases, you have to concede more often, or you have to become more likely to concede, which means I have to, when, my, when the cost of fighting the war goes up for me, I have to become more likely to win the war in order to sustain this equilibrium. Nobody believes that real wars behave like this. I think that's the embarrassing point. That's the bizarre implication, that a higher CJ leads to a, 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 um, a, a higher rate of concession and a lower expected time for the other side to uh, to concede. What's wrong? What's wrong with this is we were trying to come up with a game model that explained how inefficient wars might could continue with the with the least that is as simple as possible. So we it minimized the, our, our assumptions. One of the things we ruled out was it's clear. If 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 I'm fighting a war against you and, and you're you know if you and I are are, fight, are choosing to fight wars and not surrender to each other, it must be that at least one of us that, that we both have to have some hope that we gain something from the war. But we can't both be right. So there has to be some uncertainty. Uncertainty can be generated by randomized strategies. I can generate uncertainty for you by randomizing, and you can generate it for me. But in game theory, nobody randomizes unless they're indifferent. That's where we got the equation that gave us the lambda j concession probability, the critical success rate for each side. However, there's lots of things that are random in war. Every battle is a random variable. It's well known that when my army and your army attack each other in a, in a war, even sometimes if your army is, is, is stronger than mine, I, might, I still might, by surprise, get a victory. It happens. So there are lots, of, and everybody knows what happens in the battle. Both sides see what happens. So there are plenty of public random variables in wars. Let suppose and those battles can create become focal points, and they are sometimes. Let QJ denote the probability density of a, of a decisive victory for nation J, meaning a, that nation J might win a battle in the next period DT. There's some probability that nation J's forces might achieve a victory that is surprising and so remarkable that it demoralizes everybody in, in, in nation J and, in, and boldens everybody in nation, I'm sorry, in, boldens everybody in nation J, my nation, and, and your nation minus J, everybody gets, gets demoralized. And we all focus thereafter on the equilibrium where your side surrenders quickly and my side wins. So if QJ for me is, is the probability density of such a decisive victory, then I'm willing to keep fighting as long as, so we can have an equilibrium where well, they keep fighting until somebody wins a decisive victory. And as long as the rate of concisive, decisive victory for each nation is bigger, the, the military success rate uh, is, could be very low. But as long as it's higher than this number lambda j, which when the interest rate is low because they're patient, lambda j will be a small number if you look at the formula for lambda j in the middle of the page. Then you can have fighting for it until a decisive equilibrium, as long as the military success rate, which is a, coming from military realities and, and social realities, what do we think is a, mili is, is a decisive victory? In the Napoleonic Wars, um, the Battle of Austerlitz seemed to be a decisive victory of France over Austria, 
but a similar battle of Borodino was not perceived by the Russians as being a decisive victory for the French over the Russians. Um, so there's, so there's something social about what is a decisive victory, but if we both have an understanding of what that is, then now we have a new, a new version where um, uh, if, if, if one side um, uh, um, each side is willing to fight for a decisive victory. And now if, there's a, if it becomes common knowledge that my costs go up, uh, if those costs are still lower than the rate of my decisive victory, uh, my, if, my, if, if those costs are, if my, if my critical success rate will go up when my, when my costs go up, but if the critical success rate is still below my, my military success rate, then, we, then I, I'll continue fighting. But if, but if my costs go up so much that now my critical success rate is greater than my, my military success rate, then I would we 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 would it would naturally switch to the equilibrium where I surrender and you win. Um, uh, I suggest at the bottom of the page that one of the questions you should ask is why don't nations moderate their demand to end the conflict sooner? And I suggest at the bottom of the page a simple augmented model where each nation has a small chance of uh, at every a small chance in any short interval of time of suddenly becoming the exhausted type. What actually happened at the end of the war was the German people in the fall of 1918 became so exhausted that they refused to fight any longer. Uh, this was something that the leaders of Germany tried to conceal as long as they could because they 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 got they 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 were better able to observe domestic politics in their country than their enemies. Um, uh, and then but then it became clear and the war ended. Um, so we could say if you were to say, you know, why don't we get this war to be less costly and let's see, uh, let's each offer each other a better, let's bring VJ closer to WJ for both of us. Let's revise our offers to something more moderate. That could be interpreted as a signal that I'm getting exhausted. My, my side is about the cost of fighting is about to go up for me and you're going to find out about that. And, um, and so you, once I make any kind of negotiation opening, uh, you would just take it as as a signal that I'm about to surrender, and of course you wouldn't accept anything uh, better than surrender than my than the surrender terms. So, let me say something about 1914. Now it's coming to the end of my allotted time. I think um, I, I, this slide summarizes what I hope people would know about the background in 1914. That France and Russia had formed an alliance against Germany. Germany was allied with Austria. Um, uh, Positions of Britain and Italy and, and Turkey were less clear. Um, Germany had the strongest military forces, but feared that Russia, as I said, could become stronger by 1917 after a major rearmament program. Um, Germans were certain, Germ certain, Germ certainly Germans were considering the advantages of a preventative war. Um, uh, in in 20th of June of 1914, Austria's heir was killed by 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 Serbian terrorist faction. Who were motivated by hoping to embarrass the prime minister of Serbia in an upcoming election. Um, now Germany saw an opportunity to, uh, to 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 get some advantage. They wanted to get some advantage to establish Austria's dominance over Serbia, which was Russia's allies, so as to diminish Russian power in the Balkans. This is Germany fearing uh, Russian future dominance, and they want to get the Russians out of the Balkans. The Russians don't want to be forced out of, out of, out of a position of influence in, in, in Serbia and in the Balkans. So after, Russia, after Austria's ultimatum to Germany, Russia announced a mobilization against Austria to deter anything more than a punitive action so as to preserve the status quo balance of power. Germany, as I said, warned the Russians that mobilization could force Germany into a preventive war. And then Russia ordered a general mobilization of its forces. And now I want to stop for a moment and say, um, what should have happened next was that Germany should have ordered a defensive mobilization of its forces. Austria would have occupied Belgrade, but gone no further in a strictly limited punitive action. And there would have been very little change in the status quo balance of power, but Serbians would have been pun punished suitably for this, this assassin outrage. But instead what happened was Germany declared war on Russia and Belgium invaded France. And everybody went to try to understand why this happened. Let me talk about, there are two basic assumptions in game theory. I believe everything in game theory comes from two basic assumptions. Um, one is that the, the game is played by players and the typical assumption is nations, but we could go smaller. 
that have some rational some interests and are pursuing their interests with a rational understanding of each other. And the second assumption is that uh, that everybody's perceptions of everyone else are have some consistency. The, because a game theorist, basically this comes from, when I analyze a game as a game theorist, I think I assume, I'm assuming economic rationality of both in terms of in, interested agents that the players pursuing their, inter, their interests, the players have interests and are pursuing them, are acting to pursue them, but also that the play, I, I try to re- model these games respectfully. Not only do I, tr- I, 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 respectfully in the sense that I don't want to assume that I, that there's something that they're just wrong about. So I, whatever the, that, that implies that whatever I write in my model, I'm going to assume that the players are intelligent and therefore they understand it. And if the player, if I just said that, that means the players, intelli- whatever's in my model, everyone not only understands it, but they, un- since I just said they understand it, then they all understand, know that they all understand, which means everybody knows that everybody knows what's in the model. And 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 I can iterate that. Everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows that, that, that everything in the model is true, is a fair, is a reasonable description of the situation. The model is what we say common knowledge among the players. This is game theoretic consistency. Consistency and rationality should both be questioned. They are good methodologies. So I want to minimize how much I question them. Let me be very clear. I think I would suggest that in understanding how the nations of Europe fell into World War I, that there was a mistake, there was an irrationality. On August 1st, the German chief of staff, whose name was Helmut von Moltke, and his name is important, told the Kaiser that they had actually only one plan, and that was military mobilization. Um, Europeans became severely divided about the justice or injustice of this surprising invasion, Germany's invasion of Belgium. The Germans were convinced that this was a just invasion because a just justified response to the provocation of the Russian mobilization on Russian territory. People in Britain, for example, were shocked and agreed to join the war against Germany uh, uh, because of the unjust manifest what they considered the manifest injustice. Of, of the of this of this mobilization in Germany, even social everybody thought no, many people thought before World War I that the socialists were an international movement of poor of poor, poor workers and they would see their own interests, their common interests with other workers over the the imperialist interests of their rulers, of their ruling elite. But in Germany, the socialists, among others, were persuaded to join in support of German war efforts because they were convinced of the justice, while in France, the socialists were convinced the German invasion was an unjustified provocation and supported the launching of the war. And four plus years of horrific war uh, in, in, with an armistice uh, that it can, with the result in Europe. If I'm going to say that Helmut von Moltke just made a mistake, let me say, Helmut von Moltke, that's his name, but we can call him the Younger because in the, the Franco-Prussian War in, 19, in 1870, the German chief of staff was his uncle, Helmut von Moltke, with this, exactly the same name, or at least the, maybe the middle names differed. Uh, his uncle with the same name, Helmut von Moltke the Younger, his uncle with the same name had won the Franco-Prussian War by superior planning and management of military operation on a vast scale using the new technology of railroads brilliantly, but with planning of where all of all the railway timetables for supplies and for sending troops. For the younger Moltke, the Schlieffen plan, was des- which involved in case of any provocation, including a Russian mobilization in the East, the response of the Schlieffen plan was attack on the West to, to knock France out of the war because France is Russia's ally and do it by marching through Belgium, which is neutral. So when Russia mobilizes, we attack Belgium, we we march on Belgium to attack France. That complicated and and, and shocking response was the Schlieffen plan. It's it's got its arguments, but, uh, but, but von Moltke, the younger, only worked on the Schlieffen plan after 1913. So in 1914, when the Kaiser said, why don't we just mobilize against Russia? And if the Russians attack, we'll fight Russia and we'll have just a, a holding force on the east. Moltke said, you cannot do that, sir, because all of our plans for the supplies and tell them go to the Belgian front. 
And we can't change that. It would take us months to draw up a new set of commands for all those suppliers. And if you order your troops to the east, you'll have a vast army without food, without, without uh, su essential supplies, and then you'll be in trouble. Um, military planners now accept that civilian leaders should expect them to prepare several com alternatives for any anticipatable crises. But in 1914, complex plans for huge armies supplied by railroad were still in, you know, just the first generation of this comparatively new innovation. And I wonder whether the disaster of 1914 that, that gave us this new military doctrine of multiple plans uh, protected us from a greater disaster in the nuclear age. But I want to say, as I look at this, as I try to understand the, the, um, the situation, uh, as I'm looking at, I want to minimize the irrationality. And actually, I think groups with shared interests may reason better than individuals apart. Uh, discuss, discussing standard ideas with others can help people to think more clearly as an academia. And by that standard, we may expect a, a rational inference, more rational inference from among European diplomats who are constantly benefiting from broad discussions with uh, diplomats of opposing countries in a decentralized network. But military plans are formulated in secret by highly controlled team. The Kaiser did not know that his country had only one plan for dealing with a military, a major military crisis, a major political crisis in Europe, uh, and that that one plan inv involved attacking neutral Belgium to attack France, even if the provocation was from Russia. Um, so certainly, the, the the Germans did not the Germans did not announce to the public. The reason we're attacking Belgium is because the Kaiser actually wanted to have a defensive mobilization in the East, but he couldn't do that. We, we forgot to make a plan for that. No, they said, they argued that it was justified. The British didn't say, well, maybe the, the, Brit the, the Germans just uh, made a mistake uh, in attacking Belgium. Uh, uh, no, they said, this is a rational, this is a decision by the German leadership. The German leadership must have been, must be thoroughly militarized. I should say von Moltke's memoirs are now available in English in, on Kindle, by the way, and he's the one who tells us this story or gives us the detailed uh, uh, his, um, account of this. He never thought about overthrowing the Kaiser. The, the Germany was in 1914 was not a military dictatorship, but it they had only one plan. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Let me go to the end. Uh, oops, wait, let's. So, so I want to argue that. The peaceful equilibrium was disturbed by, uh, look, a peaceful international equilibrium may require punitive responses against those who disturb the peace, distinguishing unjustified provocations from justified responses. Before 1914, such judgments were made by diplomatic consensus among the great powers, which had norms of compensation to preserve the balance of power against any shocks. Germany's invasion of Belgium in, 19, in August 1914 shattered this consensus creating inconsistent beliefs about how the old equilibrium applied in this unexpected subgame. Sub -game. The arguments about justification were about, in the zero probability subgame where Germany invades Belgium, what are the appropriate responses that we've been relying on in order to have a century of, of peace almost all the time, with the exception, of course, of the Crimean War in, uh, in Europe since, since, since the end of Napoleonic Wars. Um, in Russia, France and Britain, Germany's invasion was seen as unjustifiable aggression and evidence of German, the German government's dangerously expansionist type. But in France, in Germany, it was seen as completely justified. And it was the provocations of the Russians and the French that caused the war. And therefore, uh, the Germans, German popular demand for certain boundary changes and occupation of Belgium in order to prevent, uh, to, to create a world where French and Russian provocations could not so threaten Germany seemed justifiable, and yet in 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 um, in, in the 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 the, the al Allied Entente uh, saw saw just the opposite. So the outbreak of war induced a basic inconsistency of beliefs. This inconsistency across nations. But I want to say something really important. This inconsistency, game theoretic inconsistency, is very difficult to deal with methodologically. But Please notice, the inconsistency across nations was derived from the factor that makes consistency a good assumption in most applications of game theory, which is the normal imperative for everyone in a society to accept focal judgments 
of generally accepted leaders in their society. Uh, let me just say briefly, this, this slide, I won't read it, I won't go through it, I'm out of time. Um, Schelling observed that games with multiple equilibria are pervasive and any society needs coordination from norms and from leaders to avoid inefficient equilibria. And the focal, this focal coordination depends on everyone's willingness to accept their, the authoritative judgment of the focal leaders in their society. So in any society, we should expect to find strong norms against questioning the universal validity of such judgments. And therefore, the power of leaders in any society can be derived from, and from their role in determining the focal equilibrium that people will play in, in games with multiple equilibria. Uh, in the war of attrition game, uh, the equilibrium where the other side is always expected to concede would be should be focal when everyone understands the morality of our position. That's a statement that we would make to try to win the war. We should try to believe that. And when two groups are contending for supreme power in their region, to accept the focal relevance of judgments from the other group would be a substantial concession. It could focus the equilibrium on one where we surrender. Um, we need, so in Germany, because people felt the only way we Germans can live with each other is if we coordinate our beliefs according to the judgments of our of the justified judgments of our leaders when the kaiser says the war is justified and, and everyone recognizes the kaiser as the leader of our of our german society we all have to believe that and and the re reverse when the justifications of of the leaders of britain russia and france um where do we go from this the final failure of the first world war was the failure to build a peace to probe the foundations of so let's say um Peace is not just, as I said before, peace, let me conclude this, peace is not just an armistice where nation weapons cease firing. In peace, nations need a mutually accepted framework for resolving disputes and for coordinating consistent strategic expectations in, a, in a transactions between them. In war, we must deny the justice of our opponent's positions, but in peace, we must join them in a shared system of justice. To go from war to peace, the essential consensus, given that leaders in any society are, 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 are pro pronouncing the, the, the concepts of justice that people need to accept, and I'm not just talking about political leaders, but more other various other religious and other civil leaders of civil, respected leaders of civil society, there are a variety of leaders that, that define uh, how a society maintains its consensus. And to join in a greater society, we all the nations of the world to live together in peace need to have some understanding of how all of their leaders can meet together to form uh, a focal arbitrating, to, become, to, form, uh, uh, to create forums who can negotiate with focal arbitration power. Uh, to go from war to peace, the essential construct consensus could be reconstructed either by negotiations among the focal leaders of the two sides or by the winning society the winning side replacing the leadership of the losing side, which would require forceful occupation of the losers' communities. After the war ended in 1918, Germany was unconquered, but its representatives were excluded from the 1919 peace negotiations uh, to def that defined Europe's new orders. Many nations had joined the Entente Alliance in order to get an influential seat at the winner's table, but intra-alliance negotiations took so long that by May 1919, when they finally finished, Woodrow Wilson felt there was no time to left to negotiate with Germany. And the resulting treaty with the war guilt clause and the reparations imposed on Germany perpetuated Germany's inability to accept the Allies' concept of a just order in Europe, which poisoned German politics and set Europe on a path to the Second World War. So I should stop there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Professor, for your insightful presentation. Uh, now we can have uh, questions. If you have any question, please raise your hand. You, you may also use the chat box if you don't have the microphone setting. I will help from here. Any question and comments all are welcome. Perhaps I shall unshare. Maybe I can ask one question. I wonder 
the role of the discount rate at your analysis. Yes. Can you elaborate it? Oh, uh, sure. So the, the discount factor, if we're talking about an annual discount rate, then, then, then these numbers could be like 5%, let's say. So it's a small number. Um, you can see that uh, the small number means that that, um, that although the the benefits of uh, the benefits of of, of of making peace in in the near future, uh, it, you know, I'm sorry, the benefits from from uh, uh, I'm sorry, the left hand side of this of this equation is is the cost. The costs of continuing the war are relatively small because it's a short period of time we're talking, just a few days. Um, DT is a few days, a small fraction of a year. The benefits are, are very small, CJ divided by GJ, because uh, they're, they're proportional to the flow cost of war and the flow benefits of, of what the other guys offer us if we if we would just make peace today. Um, the, the, the advantages are very large because we're dividing by R and we're taking, when we're very patient, a small R means we're very patient. And so the, a flow benefit is, 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 is converted to a, a lump sum an equivalent lump sum payment right now uh, uh, that's it's that's very large if the inter, if the infinite interest rate is very small uh, and that's shown by the divide by r and the, we're asking for more so now qj becomes a very small number when r is very small uh, and and the formula of course where we're, the, the the qj that makes i'm calling lambda j here the the value of qj that would make this not inequality e equation and it has an r in the numerator so that the critical success rate, if we have, if you're very patient, is is a very low success rate, and that's that's bad. That means as long as you think your the chance of your winning the war in the near future is greater than this this very low amount, this very low probability, um, well, the probability is zero if you don't have a DT, but you multiply it by the length of time with a low critical success rate, it only takes a small probability of winning the war in the near future to make it worthwhile to continue the war for a few days, and if it's always about worthwhile to continue war for a few days, uh, then um, then we get a we get a long war. And the, basically, what's happening is the more patient you are, the lower is your the, your interest rate. And the more patient you are, the lower the, the longer the, the war is going to last because the lower the, a, a small lambda that's the, the expected time of, until the other side concedes is the is the reciprocal of the success rate. So one, one mu over, which is one over lambda, uh, is, the, is the, and I reverse, which is the subscript, and for some reasons, uh, the, 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 the time until the other side is surrenders, uh, it gets larger when, when the, the probability of their surrendering in the next, in any few days is, is getting smaller. So if people get more patient, then they care more about, about winning the war than they do about the, the, the cost in any, in any period of time. And, the equilibrium was going to be one where the, the equal the equilibrium of this the randomized equilibrium is one where both sides have their where both sides have their 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 potential benefits from winning the war entirely canceled in expected value by their costs of fighting the war and the way that if if you change this, the the interest rate so as to make everybody more more care more about winning than the long run than they do about any any finite period of time all that happens is the war lasts longer. Impatient nations would fight less than patient nations in this model. And that, that I think is a reasonable assumption. Um, if we're impatient, then we'd, 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 we want to get the war over with and said, start, start enjoying life again. If we're patient, we say, listen, it's, I, all I care about is winning and um, the suffering during the, during a hundred years, of a one-year war, a four-year war, a hundred years war. Better we should suffer for a hundred years than ever let you defeat us. Well, uh, that's that's patience. And that makes it more likely we do fight for a hundred years. Or makes it more possible for us to fight for a hundred years. Thank you, Professor. Any more questions and comments, especially from our graduate students? I hope you are aware that it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to ask a question to a Nobel Prize winner. So, let's say I've talked about uh, game theory methodology. I have talked about World War One, and I have some thoughts on it. <laughs> My view of World War One, where I blame Helmut von Moltke the Younger, 
um, is, uh, you know, I think it's one interesting view. I, I, obviously, World War I is complicated, a terrible thing, and there are many explanations, and, and, and mine will not be the last attempt to focus on one. But, uh, and, uh, and there's a war going on where your country, Turkey, has a particularly important, my country, America, also has an important part in the war in Ukraine today. But uh, when, when I think, when I think about an international arbitrator, um, the war in Ukraine today is not a war for, for well, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's a war for mastery in Ukraine. Uh, it's a war for the future of Ukraine. Or is it a war for mastery in the world? Um, it's different from World War I for sure. It's similar in some ways, the magnitude of the, of the horror, horrific violence and the strength of the armies. Um, but, um, but the possibility of, 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 the, of, the, of the government of Turkey providing mediation services, well, as has already been proven to be greater than the, than the, uh, than the, um, the ability of, of, of the, the, the government of, of the United States in 1916 to offer mediation services to the war. Um, and part of that is because it's, uh, this is not per se a war for, of global domination. Uh, and the idea that Turkey, if Turkey can, can, can bring the Russians and the Ukrainians together to an agreement, uh, this would, this would have ramifications for the Russians and the Ukrainians and, and hopefully lead to, wouldn't that be nice to have, have the war end tomorrow by an intercession of the president of Turkey, but it would also make the president of Turkey and the, the nation of Turkey more important in the world. Uh, but the Russians are not fighting to prevent Turkey from being an important country in the world, whereas um, the Germans and Brits were fighting in, in um, um, Professor in World War I for global mastery. Is this a comment for the question of from Hamid Aliyev or just a coincidence? There's this question also. Can we say that the Russians' ongoing war situation looks similar to the one that happened in Germany in 1914. So Russian leaders often refer to their launch of the launch of the war as a preventive attack. Uh, so if you have any comment on this. Yeah, yeah. Good point. I, I hadn't focused on that. I think you're absolutely right that about that, at least at that part of it. Um, I should say, by the way, blaming, finding an individual person who made a mistake. Uh, Oh hell, I, I think I can find an individual person who made a mistake in uh, in, in 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 this war. I think the president of Russia. Uh, I was, just say, I think finding an individual person who made a mistake is a somewhat hopeful thing because it suggests that um, we will be able to avoid nuclear holocaust, for example. And one question we would say: Can we go into nuclear holocaust? And 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 if I believe that that happened, that these things happen when individuals make mistakes, um, that that. The 1914 was an evidence of, of, of something that's on the scale of a nuclear holocaust, for sure. Uh, a nuclear holocaust could be far worse, but let's face it, when we think about order, anything that's like what, what nuclear war could do to the world, um, in the history of the world, uh, the World War I is certainly a modern event that's in some sense is, is most comparable. Uh, and um, I think it is important, just, just as it's important now whether we have a doctrine of military planners making, I hope, I don't know, I don't know any military secrets, not in the United States, not in, and certainly not in Russia or Turkey, uh, but I hope, I, I, I'm, I feel confident without any evidence directly that in all of these countries, there is a do doctrine that mili senior military planners must have, must plan on, for any anticipatable crisis that their country could be in, they should have multiple plans of how to respond militarily uh, to those crises drawn up and ready to go so that the civilian, so the leaders of the country, top political leadership of the country can uh, have a choice at the crucial moment uh, and not be constrained by uh, by the lack of anything. Uh, but I think there was a mistake in, 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 in clearly, I think this year, I think uh, Vladimir Putin did not understand that there were profound changes, political changes in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine before 1914, before 1914, before 2014, in Ukraine before 2014, there was a deep east-west divide and the eastern provinces tended to, were much more likely to support pro-Kremlin politicians for power. And 
from 19 after late night the election in late 1914 it became it late, late 2014 this century um uh, Poroshenko's election in 2014 and Zelensky's election in 2019 both showed that uh, the, the willingness of, uh, of, of people, of Ukrainians in Eastern Ukraine to support pro-Kremlin uh, agents it politically was vastly reduced, prob probably by, by Putin's own acts of aggression against Ukraine. Um, his, Putin has an excellent security service, but they are in the bu business of disinformation. They, they're very good at providing disin, disinformation. And one of the disadvantages of having a, 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 a spy service that goes around lying to the world is that maybe they're more willing to uh, not bother telling the truth to their top leader. Uh, it's better to have, maybe it's better to have a, a spy service that has a professional commitment to truth telling. Uh, 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 and so they didn't bother telling uh, Putin the inconvenient truths about changes in Ukrainian public opinion and, and the willingness, certainly the willingness of the Ukrainians to, um, to fight and to suffer for their, to defend their, their independence, their national independence is, is far greater than Putin estimated and is the most important single factor in the war. I'd say, by the way, the second most important single factor in the war is the Russian people's vulnerability to, um, to fears of, uh, of 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 foreign invasion, uh, and, and 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 I think the talk about Ukraine joining NATO gave Putin a way that he could drum up support for this war by uh, um, by 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 suggesting that if 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 he didn't conquer Ukraine now someday Ukraine would join NATO and then you would, could have German and American troops stationed within a day's drive of the battlefield of Stalingrad and that's a hot that's got to be a hot button issue for the average Russian fundamental cause of the war which is the third most important single fact about this war is that uh is that Ukraine and Russia are kindred societies they are closely related they're close geographically close culturally and historically obviously and having a successful democracy in Ukraine would make it much harder for you to rule Russia as an autocrat because Russian people would start seeing benefits of democracy in Ukraine and say, why can't we have some of those benefits of democracy in our country? So I think that's why Putin was interested in subverting, destroying uh, Ukrainian democracy and Ukrainian independence. Um, but he couldn't sell the war to, the, to his people on that that premise. He needed to make up, to come up with something else. Uh, and uh, he thought, but a cheap and easy war, a quick victory will will, will get, can, will get you all the support you need pretty quickly because people like being on a winning team and uh, and he misestimated the will the the will of of people in every part of Ukraine including the east to resist russian invasion nationally and locally so there thank you professor there is another question from Sali Yaman i don't know if he has the microphone setting if you would like to ask for yourself otherwise i will read the question uh the question more like about a turkish historical figure a decision maker individual the ataturk how is your perception of his actions in the world war in frame of the game theory oh <laughs> i you know i honor I, to me it is you know my understanding is that late in the in the period of hostilities at the at the very end of 19 at the, of fighting in 1918 agreements were signed between uh, Ataturk was a party to agreements with with British generals who were con seeking to conquer as much as they could of the Middle East by the way one of the things in Wolford's book I should mention uh he says um why did Turkey join the war and why why did Turkey join the war on on the German side both sides were trying to bribe um you know neutral countries when Turkey was a neutral country uh, and ultimately, uh, I think the reality was the leaders, the, the leaders of the Ottoman Empire understood the British and French wanted to cut up the Ottoman Empire and, and, and take Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire and make them into uh, British and French colonies. And, uh, and, 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 and the Germans were quite willing to, to be, they, of course, wanted their relation to have an alliance with the Ottoman Empire, which would be in which maybe Germany would be the dominant partner, but the territorial integrity 
of, of, of the Ottoman Empire as it, as it existed in 1914 was something that the, Ger the German ally, their German allies would be quite willing to support. And the French, they couldn't really trust the French and the British. So why should to, 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 to do that? Therefore, British and French promises were not, not credible. But not, let's set that aside. Ataturk was not yet uh, at the, you know, uh, was not a decision maker in 1914. But what I would say amazingly, in 1918, as I understand it, there were various agreements reached between Ataturk as a commander of, of Turkish forces in, 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 in what's now Syria or Iraq and, uh, um, and the British forces that were advancing in those regions. They drew some lines. Ataturk insisted on those lines and the, and the wars of the, of the 1920s are, are about, you know, protecting what uh, the, the Turkey the territorial integrity of the Turkish boundaries, pretty close to what they are today, with one correction that happened in the in the thirties. Um, but um, to me, what the most important thing I will say about Mustafa Kemal Ataturk is, I understand he was born in Salonika. That's his hometown. Yeah. Nowhere, I don't, I do not know, and 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 I would be interested to know: was there ever a time between nineteen eighteen and and you know, and when he rose to power, or to the the time that he 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 left the scene at the end of his life, did he ever push for the to to bring Salonika back under Turkish rule, his hometown? I don't believe that ever came up. That's really remarkable. That's an acceptance. He said, "No, there are these lines that are drawn. They're, they're multi." Look, they, sh one of the things that Schelling teaches. Oh, we just. I, I, the, the, the italicized view at the top, to, to probe the foundations of social order, Schelling began by considering how limited war can be sustained by expectations that, that a beneficial, that a violation of beneficial limits by either side could change the focal equilibrium so that both sides could ignore these th limits thereafter. That's where Schelling began with his focal point effect. But then Schelling's focal point effect, which to me is the, the most important bridge between what we do in game theory and 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 almost everything else in reality. One of the most, uh, it says, in games that have multiple equilibria and, and long-term relationships involve multiple equilibria, anything that, that makes one particular bound, boundaries that make one particular division of the benefits of 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 a good relationship focal, obvious to all parties. Because that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that and 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 we must defend them, but 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 we similarly should expect our our potential adversaries to respond over with overwhelm, you know, strongly if we try to cut, uh, go beyond what our share in the bound was allowed by the boundaries. Ataturk accepted that. He took certain agreements that probably were not the most most salient agreements. I mean, agreements penciled in in, in 1918 had a somewhat in other places had a rather uh, transitory nature but uh, but he accepted them and then insisted on them and in the in you know in in the mortal war between turks and greeks for you know establishing a boundary he he insisted on turkey retaining everything that at this point in in late 1918 had been under had been conceded to 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 his country and he did not try to go farther even though pushing farther into northern Greece would have taken him to his hometown. That's a, a true understanding of the importance of uh, focal point effect. And I, I respect that in a leader. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Roger. There's this very last question, a short uh, comment, uh, explanation maybe. How would you compare the uh, world wars with the technological uh, recent wars with the advanced technology tools uh, in terms of maybe the game theory. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things I should say, I'd say is as, I, as I read the headlines in war, the first thing I think is, is that I, I like to think, oh, because I know game theory, I'm very smart about stuff. But the first thing to say about war is it's got to be unpredictable because you get smart people on both sides fighting with because they think have some realistic expectation of getting more than what the other guy thinks that they sh should be conceded and um and thing and 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 since in recent centuries uh technological change in all things has has been certainly led perhaps perhaps the technological change in military in military technology has 
I, I don't know how to graph technological change, but uh, there, there, it's been in many fronts in recent human history and in recent economic history. Of, uh, and I'm willing to believe that, uh, that, that, that if you could draw graphs across sectors, uh, that the, the, the pace of change, technological change in military technology has been at least as great as in any other economic sector of production. Um, but what? But our but our models should have a certain permanence. Uh, the the analysis of the First World War is 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 an analysis of something in modern history. But technology in in the century since then has already made huge changes. Uh, in our models, what are the important parameters? In models of I've already mentioned, and this is maybe the most important single parameter to talk about. In models of of preemptive war. The most important single parameter is how good is is the how much advantage does a, does a concentrated offensive force have over defenders? One of the things about an attacker is you get to choose where you concentrate your forces in the attack. And when I'm both of us in war are both attacking and defending, but some part of our, my strength in, in my war against you is is being focused on defensive uh, defending territory that I have. Uh, against your attacks, and at some point, and my attacking you, and I can, and, and and each of us has choices. So these are defensive operations and 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 offensive operations are different, and how good are our soldiers doing it may depend on the technology, and and uh, they nuclear nuclear weapons. Let's say milit I think air power created a, a, a tilted the balance towards offensive technology, as I indicated, mass production. Uh, but the railroads created the possibility of having hundreds of thousands of troops mobilized. Many observers throughout history, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the, the Tunisian in the 14th, in, 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 the, in, in the 15th century, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, anyway, um, have remarked, that in traditional societies you couldn't have more than twenty thousand troops actually in an army because wherever they they, they they're going to operate if they're going to be close enough to support each other they're not going to be able, able to have enough food uh, to, to to live off the land uh, if, if there's a, a greater concentration of people and railroads uh, and, and refrigeration uh, and, and canning technology uh, all understanding of bacteria and canning technology all contributed to much larger armies beginning around 1800. Um, and that, that contributed to defensive advantages. Uh, but um, uh, drone warfare seems to, uh, well, I, I actually, I'm very struck by, that it, I, and, and I'm very surprised by the way, to see that there really is effectiveness to anti-missile technology. I thought anti-missile technology was going to be, was a lost cause when, when Ronald Reagan started talking about it, uh, it what was that in the uh, uh, in the 1980s? I, th I thought this is just this is just a fantasy. But actually, uh, giving Ukrainians more of the uh, cutting edge um, anti missile technology is is enabling them to do a much better job at defending their country against uh, Russian missiles. Uh, drone technology uh, can be used both offensively and defensively. It can be used. I think we've we've developed drone technology as an offensive weapon, but now the the the, the development of anti-drone of de defensive warfare against drones, cheap attack. How to how to how to shoot down sh uh, small and 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 cheap uh, offensive drone weapons uh, is a technology which is e evolving quickly. And, and I'm guessing that you know. Let me just make one other general statement. Uh, I. Professor in America, and and I do write in military journals, but I'm a liberal, and and I don't, you know, since since Dwight Eisenhower made a speech when I was a little kid in the 1950s, uh, the military-industrial complex in the United States has not had a good name. Uh, I think the war in Ukraine has been very good global propaganda for the for the military-industrial complex in the United States, who have been working very hard to get to come up with ideas for new weapons and develop them successfully so that they get billions of dollars of my of, of, of American taxpayers money uh and uh um, I suspect that that uh, the military industrial complex has has thought for example for quite some time about the importance of developing anti-drone technology weapons to shoot down masses of drones from from the other side to prevent that you know um 
uh, defensive defense defense against drones, uh, whether that's by other drones or by ground based or air based other air based vehicles. Um, and uh, I'm counting on them to provide that for the defense of Ukraine now in this, if, if, if that's where the offense is. So I, I think we should all hope for that defensive technology will stay ahead of offensive technology because that makes for a safer world. Uh, and I don't, as a, as a layman who just reads the paper, I don't know which is, which, which is, which is happening faster. But my impression is um, that uh, uh, it's, the balance is being maintained even as as the methods of war change dramatically. I wondered whether tanks, this was this going to be the war in which tanks would prove completely obsolete uh, because of the ease with which you could send a drone over them that would then drop a, 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 a moderate sized um, explosive onto the, tr onto the tank and just blow it up um, uh, the, the, uh, to exactly target a tank using drone yeah. technology seemed almost too easy. And by the way, I think it was, Turkish drones that were supplied to Ukraine before the war that that seemed very promising but didn't seem to pan out perhaps because there weren't enough or perhaps because they weren't as good as as we'd hoped but uh, that uh, tanks are still being used but less than thought and I, I just it's it's possible that we'll find that uh, that that's changed but the one thing game theorists should expect is that um, as long as there's technological change uh, people will be working hard to come up with technical advantages for their side that will be exist for only a, a brief period of time before the other side learns to uh, to take it up. And I guess the involvement of the robotics will bring it to another level. To, oh to God! Yeah. And we've yeah. all watched movies about uh, about <laughs> the, ro the robots taking over. So let's be careful about that, please. Uh, I listen, let me say talk about the human side. I think um, there is a perception that there is an enormous benefit. Uh, the, to the Ukrainians being allied with the West that's, that has has better military technology than the Russians. And the Russians are now relying on Iranian allies uh, and, and, and North Korea for assistance. Um, is there something, is there some advantage to democracy? Look, let me just say one thing really important. Uh, I, I, I think democracy is a good thing. People are having our leaders in every country be accountable to the, to the people they, they govern. Is, uh, is 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 a good principle and 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 a move. Um, but democracy has grown in history not just because I people like me like it for the reasons that I just for moral reasons or whatever because I want to live in a democratic society, but because countries that 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 give a political stake to a larger subset of their population are better able to mobilize that population effectively in defense of the country and for conquering other parts of the world. And so democracies have uh, have a good history militarily. Demo <laughs> Certainly political inclusion has a good history militarily. It, uh, countries where a small minority uh, enjoys dominating the majority and enslaving them, those are societies which have a difficult time getting their slaves to take take risks to defend the system. In the long when 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 this competition for the turf for the turf we live on. So this is anyway, is it possible that the su superiority of of military technology from from Europe and America is due to the uh, has something to do with is es is essentially dependent on the existence of democratic uh, government political institutions in Europe in Western Europe and North America. Uh, I, I, that's a stretch. You know, I, I, th I think the answer is yes, it has something to do with it, but, 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 but exactly what is, uh, is complicated. Uh, it, you could also argue that the military industrial complex in America is just, uh, well, Americans are just addicted to arguments about paying more taxes for that are willing to pay more taxes for, for guns than they are for other stuff. Uh, I don't know, uh, for whatever reasons of American culture. Uh, but, um, but I would like to believe that. Let me just toss that out as a conjecture that I'm not prepared to argue for carefully, but it's a conjecture, it's a hopeful conjecture. Uh, the democracy and the military superiority of the weapons of the of the of the West's the West's ability to provide superior weaponry to to Ukraine has something to do with the superior productivity that in turn depends something on on freedom and and democracy in in the West. And that would be good 
and hopeful for our world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Roger. I guess we are done with the questions and thank you. I would like to thank on behalf of my university. It has been a privileged pleasure to have you in Grad Talks. Murat Hocam, a few words from you, maybe. Uh, I also want to thank you, Professor, for your presentation and joining us. Uh, I hope one day we will have you here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Most I definitely. want to come back. Yeah, we will be really happy to have you host you in our university and to have a face-to-face -face conversation. <laughs> I, I look forward to a trip perhaps in my life. I would like to go to Kiev and Istanbul. Uh, you're, you're in the same time zone. And uh, and Turkish Air provides uh, good flights, has provided good flights from Chicago to both destinations. It's a round trip one can do on Turkish Air or have been able to do. And uh, uh, to me, that that that's a world I want to live in. Thank you. Hope to meet you in near future in Istanbul. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for uh, everyone. Uh, good evening. And please like and subscribe our channel. I will we will see you next week. Thank you everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Okay. As being the host, I'm waiting for everyone to leave the Zoom room. <laughs> Thanks. I would like to bye. Bye, Professor Roger. Thank you. Thank you, sir.